All right, welcome back everybody. My name is Dr. Khan Kao. I am joined today by Dr. Alex Kassem. He's an orthopedic surgeon. Welcome, Dr. Kassem. Thanks for having me, Khan. I really appreciate it. Uh, no, I appreciate you doing uh, this for us. Um, and so he will be talking to us about orthopedic surgery and if um, the students find it a good fit for you and hopefully he'll give uh, us invaluable advice on how to um, uh, match into orthopedic surgery if you find it as a good fit. Um, so uh, we'll start off. Um, uh, so his introduction wise, uh, he went to medical school at Emory University and then he did orthopedic surgery residency at Jackson Memorial Hospital affiliated with University of Miami. And then he went to uh, do spine surgery fellowship at uh, Emory University. Is, uh, is that all correct, Dr. Gitsam? You got it right, that's right. I couldn't get enough of Atlanta. So yeah, I went back and, and did a second round there. All right, all right. Um, so uh, if you can uh, describe to us uh, a brief description of what you do um, at the bread and butter of uh, orthopedic surgery. Uh, yeah, in my, so in my practice, I mean, I, I do about 90% spine surgery. Now I do about 10% 10 10 orthopedic trauma surgery, uh, taking call. I'm in solo practice now in Los Angeles. Um, and I kind of hop from hospital to hospital and surgery centers. So I basically, um, you know, have offices on the Beverly Hills and side, and then also in the Valley. And I kind of have a wide catchment area in LA currently. So, um, you know, I'm basically having to turn over rocks and, and find where, where the business is there. Understood. Understood. That's that's uh, freaking awesome that you're able to create your own business, and we can discuss uh, regarding that later uh, down the road as far as uh, uh, academic, private setting, and things like that. Uh, that'd be appreciated. Um, so uh, I saw uh, you mean I saw your CV is pretty impressive. Uh, were you always interested in orthopedic surgery, or uh, I saw that you were part of the you mean the interest group, or did you have other uh, specialties that you were considering in med school, uh, thinking back your med school days? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, and I'm sure you remember that too, Khan, that, you know, most of us go in and we have one idea of what we want to do, and then it completely changes once we actually get into medical school. And because we have a concept of what we think something is going to be, and then we actually, you know, do our rotations or see the day in and day out so that then we find out that it's not quite what we thought it was. So, you know, I always knew that I would fall in the realm of surgery, um, but I actually thought that I was going to be a surgical oncologist for a really long time. Um, and what I came to realize is that what's really important is kind of our own internal reward systems. So for me, it, I, I ended up finding out that, you know, some of the morbidity that comes with that was a little bit hard for me to swallow. Um, and so uh, like many other people, not just in medicine, but I ended up finding out that, um, you know, pairing yourself with a, a mentor that you can envision yourself becoming um, is really important, um, you know, in any aspect of life. So I ended up finding a, a very charismatic surgeon in orthopedics that basically sold me on the concept of instant gratification. Basically, someone comes into your office, they can't even walk, and then you do a surgery, and the next day they're discharged and walking, and, you know, you really... Uh, change that person's life in a profound way uh, on a very short time scale. So um, that's kind of how I ended up falling into orthopedic surgery. Um, and I actually ended up there a little bit later than I wish I had, um, but uh, it was all for the best in the end. Yeah, it seems like, uh, you mean, you, uh, you made your path toward uh, orthopedic surgery in the end anyways. And so that's, that's pretty wonderful. Um, and uh, what drew you away from the other uh, subspecialties, if, uh, if you, you want to discuss about that, or, or uh, what other things uh, besides um, 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 surgical oncologies um, that made you decide that that's not for you? Yeah, I thought, um, you know, I think that, and, and you've had some guests on here that I totally agree with what they say in that um, not every field has a certain personality um, to some extent. I mean, you can be successful going into any field with any personality as long as you have the internal drive and that's what you want to end up doing. 
Um, but one thing that I found consistently among orthopedic surgeons and residents was they were they were had a very strong work ethic and um, they were all kind of uh, very happy to be at work and it was just a very collegial um, atmosphere and so those were both very important things to me. Um, so in some ways, uh, I think that some fields have personality types. Um, and so that was something that I could see myself doing and, um, and I could be a part of that team, basically. Mm, great. And um, can you um, describe to us the, the training path, how many years it takes and things like that and fellowships uh, and things like that? Absolutely. Absolutely. So the typical pathway is really not becoming so typical anymore. I mean, it's just the norms are changing so much. The subspecialties are getting more and more competitive across the board. And so applicants are having to find creative ways to, to make themselves stand out and, and kind of peacock, if you will. Mm -hmm. So um, I, uh, my actual pathway was that I was in a seven year combined program initially. And I went to watch my younger brother at a track meet at Emory. Uh, and then I fell in love with the philosophy of the med school down in Atlanta. And I opted out of my program and I transferred there. Oh. Um, and then so I, I did med school there and then went straight into my orthopedic residency, um, which is five years. And then there's about nine different variations of orthopedic fellowships that you can do after that. So there's, you know, trauma, tumor, mm -hmm. um, shoulder and elbow, hand is a separate one, joint replacement, sports surgery, pediatrics, spine. So more and more orthopedic surgery is becoming very subspecialized. And unless you're in a, in a rural area, um, you're almost mandated by the professional environment to, to do some kind of fellowship. And all the fellowships are, are one year um, in length. So um, you know it's not too much time out, um, out of the bucket for you professionally and financially, but. Um, but I will say that the, the traditional pathway is to do five years of residency, one year of fellowship, um, but now you're seeing more students um, taking a research year or more than a year or uh, doing a broad work um, uh, or something else where they, they kind of try to make their application a little bit stronger and that's becoming the norm. Interesting, interesting. Um, because surgery can have a five or seven years, but mostly orthopedics are five years and then they can take an extra year um is it because uh, just to be more competitive with a fellowship then it's sorry I, I should clarify that the the extra year is within the the medical school realm it's it's not um in the in the residency realm it's oh. just to be able to get into the actual uh, residency i just think that across the board residencies and subspecialties are becoming more desirable for a number of reasons, mostly I think financial, but in any case, um, uh, I think that that's kind of pushing students to figure out more creative ways to uh, make themselves more competitive. Yeah, yeah. I'm not sure if you're aware, you probably are, but uh, step one event, uh, soon will be pass fail, right? I heard that, that's amazing. That's yeah, As, uh, you mean there are pluses and minuses to it. I think there's more pluses in my opinion to reduce the stress and open doorways for, uh, for other uh, to pursue a, a more competitive um, field. Um, so how do you, uh, with that being one of the factors um, of, of residency, how do you, uh, uh, what do you say to students to say, um, to make them more competitive? That's a great question. I mean, uh, you know, I think that ever since uh, you know, the Yale model kind of instilled this, this new curriculum, which I thought was actually a very positive educational paradigm shift, uh, where the first two years were also pass fail there. And a lot of schools, including Emory, had actually adopted that as well. Um, and now step one is becoming pass fail. So you're right, it's becoming much harder to distinguish yourself as an applicant. Um, so I think that the, the main two things that I would say for people who are going into orthopedic surgery is, you have to do well on your bread and butter uh, clinical rotations. I think those grades still stand in your third and fourth year. Um, and then the other thing that I would really recommend is aligning yourself with some of the more prominent people uh, at your institution in orthopedics and trying to produce as much research that you can you know, talk intelligently about in the future. I, I think that that's really uh, where things are moving, having uh, recommendation letters uh, from, you know, 
high standing people and then also having the research to show your interest level and that you're going to contribute to the field in the future is what a lot of academic institutions are looking for now. Okay, awesome. Thank you for that advice. Uh, what are the things that excites you uh, regarding orthopedic surgery? Yeah. Um, I, I think part of it comes back to the uh, return, return of function. I think the instant gratification part of being able to fix someone and see the immediate results is what really gets me up in the morning. Um, those post-op clinic visits, even one or two weeks after surgery, seeing how happy your patients are, whereas you remember just a few weeks ago how miserable they are. Uh, it's just a stark contrast and being able to see that is incredibly rewarding and what gives most of us, I think, purpose. Um, and then on the spine surgery side for me particularly, I, I really enjoy that uh, the creativity in the treatment plan design. So I think that there's a lot of different ways to solve most spine problems. So being able to create patient specific treatment uh, pathways and surgical um, techniques is, um, uh, is what kind of gets me up in the morning and keeps things exciting. Yeah, I have to say, I mean, as a um, emergency physician, I do like that instant gratification of reducing, say, somebody's uh, fractures or dislocation, or even like, I think the, my favorite is like patella dislocation. It's like the quickest thing that like, <laughs> reduce some pain when the patients and their their parents are freaking out. Like, Why don't we give anything for pain medication? I was like, watch. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I was, I was like, we don't need to. I just need to push this thing back in. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and you're absolutely right. I mean, when we do reductions to with the, you know, the the ER teams, and you know, everybody gets a successful reduction, and then you're high fiving each other, and it's just, you know, it's just a really pleasant yeah. experience. Yeah, so I'm working on that. Definitely one of uh, one of my uh, top reasons to be an a, uh, ER physician. That's for sure. Um, on the other spectrum, uh, what do you find that are frustrating? about orthopedic surgery that students should be aware of that uh, you mean their mentors or whoever they may not tell them? Yeah. Um, I think probably the most frustrating part about orthopedics sometimes can be that because what you do is you impact people's uh, you know, quality of life and their functional outcomes, these people are usually patients who have been seeking answers or dealing with, um, you know, difficulties, both physical and, and psychological for a long time before they walk into your door. Mm -hmm. um, and so oftentimes I, I kind of think of, um, if we're in a neighborhood, I think of orthopedic surgery being next door neighbors to, uh, you know, pain management physicians in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. And so um, dealing with chronic pain patients, and some of them are even, you know, uh, pain seeking in a lot of ways. And, and you see that all the time as well. Um, but that is an, that can turn into a very frustrating conversation uh, to have. And, um, you know, as much good as we do, sometimes you run into a brick wall when, you know, your intentions and the patient's intentions just never align. And so that, that's probably the most frustrating part for me. Yeah. Yeah. Um, sorry, I froze a little bit there. Yeah. I think um, you hit the nail for our specialty, the chronic mm -hmm. pain as well. And it's, it's, difficult, I mean, for us uh, um, to have that discussion. And it's, it's, it's tough when we only have like two minutes, we're not gonna be able to change their minds on their chronic pain as well. So I can imagine with you, I mean, dealing with patients who come back often because they're your patients, uh, so I can imagine so. Um, uh, what are some myths uh, about orthopedic surgeons that you think are unfair um, or untrue? Uh, I, don't, I don't know if it's untrue, but one of the myths that I think a lot of people in the hospital will, will tell you is that, um, you know, their orthopedic surgeons are just all about bones and they don't know anything about internal medicine or they've forgotten their internal medicine training. And maybe that to some degree becomes more true. Uh, but I'll, I'll also remind, I think, a lot of our colleagues that, um, you know, they're learning an entirely different field of medicine that we just never learned in, in medical school. It's a completely different branch of medicine. Um, and so while internal medicine and a lot of our other uh, fields, they build off of the, the training we got in medical school, you know, the orthopedic guys are having to kind of house a lot of other stuff. And then their list sometimes can be, you know, several pages worth of patients. So, um, 
you know, one thing I like to just remind some of my colleagues is just say, hey, if we're coming to you, it's because we need your help. We need your expertise. Don't take it as a way to feel that we're offloading work on you. It's just that, uh, you know, we've got our hands full and uh, we'd, we'd love to kind of co-manage the patient with you. So I think it's kind of something where I like to uh, refocus our team and, and bring everybody on the same page and, and uh, make sure that we're taking care of the, uh, the patient in the best way. So. Mm, okay. I appreciate the answer. And then, so how has um, orthopedic surgery um, affected your work-life integration uh, now that you're attending? Yeah, um, I don't know that orthopedic surgery has changed my work-life balance. I mean, if anything, maybe in my personal life, I'm doing uh, less risky activities. I'm not, you know, skiing black diamonds or something like that, but <laughs> Um, but in terms of my actual work-life balance, I wouldn't say the field itself has changed it. It's more my practice model um, in that I have to take more call in order to kind of keep the lights on in some ways. Mm -hmm. um, and so in, in that regard, I mean, maybe one to two weekends out of the month, I'm, I'm taking some kind of either spine or trauma call. Um, uh, but that's, that's pretty much it. Otherwise, I, I think that I, I probably work between 60 to 80 hours a week, something like that. It's quite a bit, um, but uh, like you said, um, there's probably different uh, practice metal, uh, models, and uh, you described to, uh, to us that you're uh, independent, essentially a contractor. Um, it sounds like there's multiple types. Uh, you can work in a group, you can work in an academic setting. Can you describe all, this, uh, all those? And this is probably geared more toward residents, but uh, I think students sh should know about these. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It's something to think about going in because I'll tell you, um, when I was a young resident, I was not thinking about uh, the days that I showed up to my attendings clinics and they would have a full schedule. I wasn't thinking about at all where these patients were coming from. Um, you know, you don't realize that the healthcare system is just funneling these patients uh, into the offices of a lot of these surgeons. And uh, for a lot of the private practice groups, even the, the large um, multi subspecialty guys who have paired together, um, they're having to go out and market themselves and promote themselves and find referrals um, any way that they can. And so um, you kind of almost become a marketing consultant for yourself as part of the job description once you go into private practice. Um, so that's something you have to think about. Whereas I think the academic side has an advantage that they're able to um, you know, sit back and kind of focus a little bit more on the, uh, the clinical aspect of the, of the care of the patient. Um, so, but on the other hand, you know, I, the reason that I, I did what I'm doing, and I think a lot of the private guys do what they do, um, is because they like to be able to control their, the direction of their own st uh, ship. So mm -hmm. um, just being able to be the captain of your own ship, I think is, a, is still a valuable, um, uh, a valuable lesson there, so. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I appreciate, uh, I mean, how you made your decisions based on what you value um, in your life. And I think students should hopefully figure out what their values are and hopefully make the decisions based on their values as well. So I appreciate your answer. Absolutely. Um, yeah. uh, so um, how, ha has, how has orthopedics changed over the years? I, I know every specialties has been affected by COVID, if you can discuss that. And then what do you see in 10 to 20 years down the road if there's any uh, changes? Yeah, it's, it's interesting because every orthopedic subspecialty in a lot of ways is kind of on their own track and they're um, on their own kind of pathway to um, you know, developing in their own timeline. Uh, and, and what I mean by that is some fields are not changing at all. Like uh, in a lot of ways, uh, orthopedic trauma surgery has been the same for a, a rather long time. Mm -hmm. um, but in some fields, you're having very rapid bursts of growth. Uh, joint replacement is a good example. That spine surgery is a great example of that. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, for me particularly, I, I see a lot of um, AI coming into orthopedics moving forward. Um, I actually wrote uh, some about uh, the arrival of robotics in, in orthopedic spine surgery. Um, and I think that the field itself is putting a lot of money into that. And right now it's more of a marketing uh, gig, but 
it is gaining traction. And I think that it probably will uh, be the future. You know, when I'm retiring, I, I anticipate that there will be uh, some pretty amazing, uh, you know, technical machines out there available um, that are able to do some of the things uh, better than what we're able to do in a more efficient way um, with our oversight, of course, uh, being present. But it'll be an interesting uh, uh, future to see. Yeah, that's uh, interesting. Uh, I didn't realize how how much AI could potentially affect orthopedics. I, I think everything is so manual or, um, or even robotic, like the, uh, the minimally invasive surgery that they have like urology and other uh, uh, um, surgical subspecialties. Um, I always thought orthopedics would be, you know, big bones and, and whatnot. And, and yeah, yeah. Especially, so I, I mean, I think that where we're looking at is more, uh, precise, uh, instrumentation placement. So I, I think that 3d spatial orientation and being able, um, to put the screws, uh, exactly where they need to be, um, in a more refined and precise, uh, uh, position every time um, is, is where orthopedics wants to move. Um, so we'll see what happens. Cool, cool. Thank you. Um, uh, do you work with uh, NPs and PAs? I know you're in independent uh, contracting, but um, if you don't have experience with working, uh, um, do you know of other people um, that worked with NPs and PAs? And how do you think uh, the responsibilities uh, will shift over time? Yeah, it's a great question. I think that, um, so let me ask, answer your first question. I, I work with uh, PAs mostly in the operating room as first assist for me mm -hmm. um, to kind of ease case flow and, and, and just as a, another set of hands. Mm -hmm. um, in surgical fields, I don't see the role of physician assistants and nurse practitioners changing significantly. Um, maybe on the clinic side, you know, holding their own clinics and that kind of thing. Um, but I think that uh, the actual surgical procedures are, are more sacred and protected for the, for the surgeon themselves. Um, you know, I think that, you know, you guys in particular in ER, you're seeing kind of this huge uh, wave of shift in terms of, of what is happening with NPs and PAs um, and what the, you know, the breadth of, uh, of what they're able to do is. And then, you know, especially, you know, once you, uh, kind of look at that concomitantly with how many physicians are coming out into practice now, it's, it, you're almost running into a turf war. But I think going back to, you know, orthopedics is that as long as I think that there's, um, you're within the realm of surgery, I, I can't see the actual scope of what the, uh, the mid-level is doing changing significantly. Okay. Uh, I appreciate your insight into our, uh, my, uh, my specialty as well. Uh, which you mean... Uh, I, I just, yeah, uh, there, uh, there needs to be a, a shift in my specialty, especially for the, the MDs and DOs on how to figure out and solve this, this solution. Uh, otherwise, their residents might come out not having a job, which is kind of, uh, which is kind of sad, uh, given yeah. how much we uh, put in our um, effort to, to get to where we are. Uh, but yeah. it's good to know that orthopedics is uh, protected. And now uh, that segues into my next question. Um, because, uh, because orthopedics is quite competitive, um, but you never know, uh, how do you think the job market uh, will be in say five to 10 years for the students watching this? Yeah, I think that the Academy and uh, the ACGME and, and a lot of the programs are basically doing a really good job of keeping the uh, numbers of, of, training, uh, of trainees down um, to the appropriate level. And then I think that as, you know, uh, a lot of orthopedics is basically based on degenerative pathways. And so as we have populations that are living longer, there'll be more of a demand for orthopedic surgeons. Um, so I, I think that the, the demand will, will be there for the, for the time being, um, you know, at least until I take down my shingle. So. <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. Thanks. Um, and then are there, uh, other career opportunities besides uh, once you graduate residency fellowship, are there other career opportunities you can do outside of the clinical work? Uh, within orthopedics? Yeah, I mean, um, you know, there's, there's research-based positions. I think that, you know, some 
some of my friends are getting interested in the in the VC realm and, and kind of going into um, you know medical consulting and, and that uh, you know that kind of thing. I think that um, again, as AI progresses, too, that you're always going to need medical consultants and musculoskeletal specialists to kind of weigh in um, on the direction of, of uh, you know what makes sense. Mm. What sound so i think that those are kind of the main uh places that i see people who are who are not uh, solely based going in orthopedics okay all right well, thank you and then uh what are some useful helpful um resources that students can uh go find or uh, or your advice and uh to help them know if orthopedics is right for them absolutely um, I think that the Academy, the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgery is a great resource. They have a website, the AOS. Um, the other thing is that um, there's a lot of social media um, outlets now, um, you know, doing similar to what you do, but also um, more specific to orthopedic surgery um, that gives uh, people kind of a day in the life of an orthopedic resident or even just an outlet for, or a medium for someone to reach out and, and ask questions if they want to. Um, one of the best resources I think is if, if your institution has in-house orthopedic residents or, or if they're being covered, if the hospital's being covered by orthopedic surgeons, um, then that's really the best resource. Most people uh, do what they're doing to be able to give back and, um, uh, uh, and teach students. So um, even just a cold email or, or walking up and introducing yourself, I think goes a long way um, as, as one of your best resources. That was certainly my best resource uh, during, during medical school. Um, and then, you know, I'm also happy and available if anyone wants to email me, um, you know, if they want to reach out, I'm happy to go over uh, orthopedic specific questions for them. Okay, I appreciate that answer. Um, and uh, and uh, giving your um, contact information if uh, students want to, to reach out. And I, sure. I mean, uh, I've talked to many uh, specialists on uh, on this channel, uh, and it, mentoring or reaching out is is a very crucial step in advancing somebody's career. Um, and it's, I mean, it's helped me, and it's helped a lot of the the people I've uh, interviewed with. And if the students are hearing this, uh, if they want to pursue, just just reach out. And the worst thing that can happen is. No, right? No. That's right. That's right. Uh, uh, and hopefully uh, your pride is not hurt by it. But, <laughs> um, but um, so my last question um, uh, before uh, uh, giving back your, uh, your free time is, uh, do you have any um, uh, top advice for students who want to pursue orthopedics or just in general, uh, anybody in medicine? Yeah, I, I would say for, you know, if you're considering orthopedics, um, like I said, I think you have to look in, it's, a, it's an internal search because I think that some people like the idea of a field, but they, you really have to immerse yourself in it before you understand. What I always say is um, if you're going to pick a field, you don't, you can't just like the, the fun parts of it. You have to also be okay with the terrible parts of it too. So the bad days, have to not be that bad for you basically if you're going to select that field in a lot of ways um, and again i think that the the reward system is is critical you have to know yourself and say hey what gets me up in the morning what's what you know where do i find purpose in medicine um, and uh, the rest of and everything else will follow i think okay well uh, i just wanted to take this time to thank you dr Gassem, for um, volunteering to do this. Um, I know you work way too many hours per week and uh, I appreciate you doing this uh, for me and then also the channel uh, and hopefully the students find it uh, valuable. And if there's anything else that you'd like to add that you think are useful to, for students to know, uh, feel free to use this time. Um, but I appreciate you doing this. It's my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me um, and I appreciate what you're doing for the students as well. Yeah, thank you.